What's up, guys? Big Luke here, man of the free, freedom of mind, money, and media. And boy, am I glad to be back in the studio. Taking a little sabbatical from recording videos, not on purpose. Uh, well, kind of on purpose. I took a, took a vacation, went down to the sunny state of Florida, went and saw the fruits of Ron DeSantis' labor. Boy, you know, don't like to get political, but you know, when a state is clicking, a state is clicking, and I give credit where credit's due, and that's a beautiful place, man. Everywhere you go in that state, there's construction, there's roads being built, there's landscapers out tidying things up, edging grass, putting new concrete, restuccoing things, painting. You see the occasional celebrity. I'm, I'm referring to the southernmost part of Florida, probably the bottom third. We spent some time in Fort Lauderdale, Miami, um, where else? Boca Raton, Pompano Beach, or Boca Raton for the natives. Just a beautiful place down there. So I'm glad to be back in the studio. Took some time away. Rest, relaxation, recharge the batteries with the families. With some much needed time, made some good memories, had a lot of fun. But boy, you know you're an entrepreneur and you know you're a businessman when you start to itch to get back to work. Now, I don't know how many of you out there go through this, okay? Um, but... But your buddy, Big Luke, man, it's about seven days. That's my threshold, okay? The very first day, it's get settled in. The next day, it's enjoy a few sights, maybe have a couple cocktails, have some dinner, whatever. You know, day two, day three, day four, you're enjoying things, you're having fun. You know, all the while, as a business owner, the phone is occasionally ringing. Now, my team was pretty good about trying to, you know, keep, uh, keep my phone from ringing, aside from the occasional call from the new guy. But uh, they did a good job made some money. They were prosperous while I was gone. But, uh, you know, as time progresses, when you have the the weight of, or the burden, and I don't mean that in a negative way, uh, but but the burden of a business, the, the weight of a business, the, you know, the responsibility, if you will, of a business and employees and inventory as well. You know, when I'm gone, cars are getting sold and they're not getting replenished. So that builds over time. Not to mention, man, if you're like me and success is a drug, then being away from your business, not having your finger on the pulse of what's going on, you know, not being able to build, expand, scale the things that I like to do and enjoy doing on a daily basis, well, it starts to plague you. So we got to, you know, day seven, day eight, my wife's looking at me, we're sitting by the pool and the kids are playing and she kind of looks and says, it's about that time, isn't it? I said, yep. And you know, sporadically throughout the vacation there was zoom calls there was you know a few things going on for some other projects i'm working on but this time around i tried to keep it mainly on business but about day seven day eight the itch came and uh, an entire week without recording man of the free man that's that's slow torture right you guys are my audience you're my people you're my followers you're the ones we're trying to wake up and help the people we're trying to progress and move forward in your mind money and media and in your life and livelihood so i'm back ladies and gentlemen i'm back with a vengeance i'm recharged i'm Slightly tan, still Ruben. Am I slightly tan? Just a little bit. Put the lights down a little bit, try to accentuate the brown. A little gram on my cracker this week, ladies and gentlemen, but uh, I'm back. I'm ready. It's time to learn. It's time to grow. It's time to get better. It's time to make some money, okay? So the reason for today's episode, okay, we're going to touch on a little freedom of mind and freedom of money, all right? There's a reason I'm doing today's episode, and I'll allude to why a little bit later on, but we're going to get right into it, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we're talking about the importance of being American and buying American. There was a time the United States of America was a manufacturing superpower. I don't know how old you are, but if you're my age, little older, slightly younger, you remember at one time, General Motors, who owns Chevrolet, Cadillac, Ford, and Chrysler, who is your Dodge and your Jeep, or was at one point, were known as the big three auto manufacturers. They were forces to be reckoned with. They made the cars. Everybody else tried. The Germans, the Germans, they was coming up with the best they could do because they specialized in luxury and leather seating and ventilated headvests and funky little motors with the diesel, yeah. Onk, they did a good job, but they was not American. They was not spunky. They did not have the powers, the skills, and... Mm. They just didn't have it. It's pretty good, right, Ruben? That was very good. <laughs> Thank you very much. My last name's Lunkenheimer. Anyways, so you had Ford, you had GM, you had Chrysler, okay? You had, uh, God, was it Lee Iacocca or is he a football coach? Who am I trying to remember? We're going to Google that right now because I'm just not going to move another muscle until I figure that out. Hey, Google, who was Lee Iacocca? Okay. 
Okay, yep. Lee Iacocca was an American automobile executive best known for the development of the Ford Mustang, Continental Mark III, and Ford Pinto cars. So, guys, he's a little... He, he predates me, but I just remember these names, right? I remember, you know, Alan Mullaly's. I remember, of course, Henry Ford. I remember these people that were just pillars of American business, okay? Guys that the country revered in politics. They would have political prowess and they would have say in political matters, uh, but they were, they were, you know, capitalists. They were dreamers. And these men were, uh, and women, were the people that moved the brands forward and moved the United States of America forward. So the big three, right? Who else? There was the Carrier Corporation right here in good old central New York, okay? There was a marked amount of companies. I mean, just the amount of companies that existed stateside that manufactured products. Take Erie, Pennsylvania, for instance. You can drive through Erie, Pennsylvania, and I, I'm remiss to say the amount of empty buildings you would find. Giant, massive brick structures that once housed the building blocks of the American economy and the American workforce are empty, okay? From sea to shining sea, we had nothing but a pulse, a heart beating in building, in business, and our oil production, okay? The, the back and forth movement of the anvil wells in, in Texas and in the great, great West and Midwest. I mean, this was what we stood for. We were America, we were the builders, we were the producers, we were the land of the free and the home of the brave. So what happened? At some point, leaders of government convinced Americans that moving production overseas would benefit them. Now, in reality, who does this benefit? It benefits the manufacturers. It benefits the deepest pockets in the United States of America to become deeper, okay? Very rarely will you hear me remark about businessmen and entrepreneurs and greed and wealth because I'm a businessman and I'm an entrepreneur, and I'm greedy, and I'm wealthy. No, not too greedy. I wanna make money, I wanna be wealthy, I wanna support my family, I want success, but I don't want all of it. I want my fellow American to aspire to great things. I want him or her to be wealthy, or he, she, or them. I want everybody to get their piece of the pie because it exists in this country. There is so much to be had. Everybody deserves their peace. But there are some people who just aren't satisfied. There are some people who no matter what you give them, it is never enough. They can ask for the world, but when you give them the world, they look through their telescope and they see Neptune and they say, I want that too. Well, what use do you have for it? It will do you no good, I don't care. It's there, it belongs to them, it must belong to me. Now this is an analogy and a metaphor, but it's widely accurate in mindset. This is how these people behave. So, the great thinkers, the luminaries of politics and big business managed to convince Americans by way of corporate media, narratives, we see them every day in the media, freedom of media, it's important, that's why we're here. There is a coordinated effort amongst the largest and deepest pockets in the United States of America and the world to conspire against the middle class, the working class, and the poverty class to continue to keep them on a pedestal and us down low. Pause, footnote. Is Big Luke promoting a conspiracy theory? No. The word conspiracy or to conspire, look it up. Stop reacting with what you've been spoon-fed by the mainstream media. I'm using a word, okay? To conspire is to coordinate against another party to a certain end, okay? And if you look up the definition, it may truly not even be to conspire against a party, but it's a group of people or ideas conspiring to a particular end, okay? It doesn't have to be nefarious or malicious intent. It really just means working together to get to a common goal. And that goal for these people is wealth and power. So what am I telling you? These men managed to convince our mothers and fathers, grandfathers and grandmothers, and to some extent you and I, depending on the age of the audience, that by sending manufacturing jobs overseas, to Thailand, to Vietnam, to China, that we would lower the cost of producing the good so substantially, 
that it would boost the American economy like nothing else could. They managed to convince you that instead of putting money into your own companies here locally, instead of putting money into your own goods, the products that were created on the same soil that you walk upon, they were able to convince the American people that by sending jobs to the other side of the world where people work for pennies on the dollar and the suicide rates are some of the highest in the entire world, they managed to convince us by sending that sending jobs over there, by sending jobs over there, it would somehow benefit us, okay? So what really happened? We got a lesser quality product. You ever heard the saying, this cheap China junk? It's not racist. It's nothing against the Chinese. It's against where it was manufactured and by whom, which happens to be from China, okay? Stop with your triggers. Everything isn't racist. Everything isn't an attack. It's okay to be uncomfortable. Trust me. It's how I've become successful. So we end up with a cheaper quality product, okay? We end up with closed factory doors. We end up with high paying, living wage jobs that allow the American working class to get better, to put their children through college, to buy the four-door pickup truck with leather seats, to get their dream house, to live and fulfill the American dream in its entirety with pensions and retirement so they can enjoy their golden years, with health plans so if they are sick or their loved ones become ill, they can be remedied and it doesn't cost them their life savings. We've shut down factories. We've killed jobs. We've killed entire towns. Drive through Erie, Pennsylvania. Drive through the manufacturing district of Syracuse, New York. Drive through Detroit, Michigan. This is your home, ladies and gentlemen. These are the states and the towns in which you live. And they are decimated. They are empty. They no longer pulse with the energy and the vigor of American production. Okay? So... You may be asking, well, you know, Luke, (laughs) dollar and 99 cents for a loaf of bread is is pretty decent. It was. But have you noticed recently that the costs of goods and services have escalated exponentially? Well, why is that? Why can't we control the prices of the goods that are in our economy? Well, it's because we don't make them. We cannot control what we don't manufacture. Long ago, when the idea of globalization came to the forefront, and Bill Clinton and his band of merry gypsies decided that globalization and uniting fronts around the world for trade, NAFTA, Trans-Pacific Partnership, these agreements that allowed countries to trade back and forth with no tariffs or minimal tariffs, and very little repercussions, very little regulations, that this is somehow beneficial for us. Well, guess what backfired, ladies and gentlemen? Because now you're not in control of the price of oil that you pump into your vehicle every single day. Well, don't worry about it, they say. We're going electric. And then moments later, tell you to not charge your electric vehicle tomorrow because there is a rolling blackout in the area in which you live. And even though we have compelled you to convert your entire home to solar and to convert your entire garage to EV, we're gonna have to ask you to go ahead and not charge that vehicle in California today because we just don't have the power grid to support it. Oh, but by the way, T minus eight years, we're gonna be all electric all across the country. What are you going to do about the power grid? The power, what? I'm sorry, down in the back. Anyways, what was your question? Right. To duck and dodge the question of the inevitable is to set us up for failure. It was early on when globalization became such a great idea and a force to be reckoned with and the wave of the future. Well, it's here now, ladies and gentlemen. We are living examples of the repercussions of governmental actions. By 
creating a foreign dependency, oftentimes from a government in which we are adversarial to. <coughs> China. Was that subtle enough, Ruben? So I feel like I pulled it off. Ruben's sick, guys. Dependence on foreign entities is the nearing of the end, okay? And I'm not some doomsday prophet. I'm just telling you, when you lose control incrementally and instrumentally, piece by piece, of the pieces and the fibers of the fabric that weave the country in which you live, well, you're destined for failure, okay? What does that look like? We can postulate, but for now, let's stick on the topic at hand. So we've seen the detriment of depending on foreign entities for products, right? If China decides that the shirt you're wearing, I didn't show nipple, did I? No. Good. If China decides that the racerback tank top that I so enjoyably wear on my show and during my workouts, it's going to be 50 bucks today instead of $5.99. Well, I don't control that because I don't manufacture it. Okay. If the Saudi crown prince decides that oil isn't going to be produced this week, well, we have nothing to pump in our car. OPEC or no OPEC. If there ain't no oil, we can't control the price of it. And we can't distribute it. And when we empty out our strategic oil reserves to lower the price of gasoline instead of negotiate diplomatically with someone who, oh, wait, that's right, he's the pariah of the world. Did you guys not remember that? The current sitting U.S. president called one of the leaders of his territory in which a large majority of American used petroleum is cultivated from a pariah of the world. Well, when you call somebody a pariah of the world, it's very difficult to then go back to him a year or two later and say, hey, Jack, come on, man. Just open up those, uh, those oil pipelines, man. Just, just juice us back up. It was just political gander. It was just poppycock. You know that what? No? Okay, oh, he's not going to even see me? That wasn't him? Oh, that was his butler. Right. <laughs> There's some things that the news gets right, guys. And the fact that it was absolutely absurd to make that loose of a comment about somebody who holds that much control over oil supply, well, they're right. It's stupid. So we don't control the supply of oil. Now, we were paced to. We were building pipelines. Okay. This could go in an entirely different direction, guys, but we're going to stay on task. I'm not going to get too political on you. But what we're going to discuss is the benefit of buying American, okay? What is the purpose of this show today? It's to educate, okay? There's, there's the ease of saying something as simple as be American, buy American, right? There is not a lot of effort behind telling somebody to be a patriot and buy the things that are produced and reside within the walls of the country that they live, okay? What's difficult is to explain why you should do that, okay? Ruben, it's live. And I'm thirsty. Mm. He's catching on, guys. Took us 17 episodes, but he's with me. Love you, buddy. So, guys, why should you buy American products? Why is it important to support American business, okay? Because you maintain cash flow. You control cash flow. We've been printing money hand over fist for years now, okay? Our debt looks like the freaking, what the hell's that cartoon where the clock spins? It's the freaking uh, Alice in Wonderland where the clock's just spinning and the gears are flying out of it. That's our national debt ticker, okay? <laughs> and the, the, the entities in which we owe that money to, well, that's for, a, that's for a whole nother episode, okay? But very simply, when you control where the money stays and you keep it in your country, you control your economy. Very simple. It, even the simplest of minds can appreciate that concept, okay? Furthermore, you keep your production domestic, you get a higher quality product because you're accountable, right? You buy a shitty t-shirt, ah, I just it was some Chinese-made piece of junk, right? 
You buy a t-shirt from somebody who manufactured it two states away. It's like, you know what? I bought six of these. Five of them broke. Son of a bitch. I'm going to package them up. I'm going to drive over there and I'm going to raise holy hell. When you're building products and goods that are bestowed upon and sold to the people that surround you, you bet your bottom dollar. There is an intrinsic accountability that must be met. Substantial benefit to producing the products nearest to your home. They will be better. Your fellow Americans will build products that are better, okay? With a higher quality product, you can charge more money, okay? So the consumer in you says, well, <laughs> doesn't sound good to me. I don't want the idea of that, paying more. Oh, but you do. You can buy a TV and you can replace it two years from now when the LEDs start to go and the remote stops working and the kids have thrown a Nintendo Wii controller at it too many times and it just doesn't work anymore, okay? You can buy one every two years for 399 bucks or you can spend 550 and for a decade be watching the same TV because with more money comes better raw materials, comes better assembly, comes better quality check, comes better final product, okay? I only speak on things I know about, guys. My company, my group of used car dealerships, CNY Drives, we have a 60-point quality check, okay? We scrutinize every automobile the exact same way, and it takes time, almost two hours per car. We check belts, hoses, seals, tires, brakes, fabrics, heaters, air conditioning, headliners, odors, you name it. Three people have to sign off on that same list and agree that they would put their own children in the automobile before it reaches our customer's hand. If three people have to sign off on it and three bodies have to okay it and three sets of eyes have to look at it, the possibility for failure goes down to almost nothing. It's a statistical certainty, okay? But it takes money. They're not going to do that for $7.99 an hour. They're just not going to. They're not going to spend the time. It's not going to be worth it. The sweat, the time, the overtime, the extra work, the extra arduous, tedious job, it's just not going to be worth it, okay? When you can give somebody health care, when you can give them a pension, when you can give them money to put in their savings account, and you can give them a reasonable living wage so they can be proud to walk into the store because they can buy the name brand cereal that they want to instead of having to clip out a coupon and try to save with an app and buy the bag cereal on the bottom shelf. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Tutti Fruities are pretty good. You give people pride, okay? What comes with pride? Energy, motivation, camaraderie. With all of those positive words come additional positive attributes. When people have pride in their job because they are paid well to do it, they will continue to make a better product. The company will continue to scale. The quality of the product will continue to grow and the technology will improve. It's an absolute statistical certainty. Here's a fun fact for you, thanks to the Financial Times. Guys, I prepare for these shows. I don't just wing this off the hip. Some of the incredibly charming and funny improv comedy that you see on this show is off the hip, but the facts are not. The Financial Times, in a recent documentary that I watched while I was pumping some iron with my Rata Super Note, preparing for Man of the Free, I learned that domestic companies who are ready privately owned, that means family owned and operated, that means operated by somebody who does not have international or large corporate interest. Privately owned companies and factories in the United States of America spend approximately 20%. That's right, one fifth. They spend 20% more on improving the technologies and upgrading their equipment in their facilities. And they spend 20% more on hiring practices and training and trade schools for their employees. Let that sink in. Your cheap China junk goes to a factory in an assembly line where on the perimeter of the building, they have suicide nets 
So when the employees run and jump out the window, it catches them. And you think I'm kidding. Ruben, can we show them a picture? I believe it's Apple, the factory, right outside their windows. They have little nets. So when the people jump out the windows, maybe Nike, it's a major company, and it's going to bother you to see this image. But Ruben will show you. It's going to be up here somewhere. Or maybe make it the whole screen. I don't know. Suicide nets. Because their job is oh so pleasant. And they have such a strong sense of pride in what they do. That you got to net the building so when they jump out, because they've had enough, you can catch them and put them right back to work. Not making this up, guys. By buying American, you avoid dependence on a foreign entity, okay? Earlier in this podcast, I said also adversarial at, uh, excuse me, adversarial at times. What that means is we are actually buying products from our enemies. Let that really sink in for a minute. There's some guy, right? And he's your competitor. You own a lemonade stand and he owns a lemonade stand. You got to have fresh lemons to make good lemonade. Stop and think for a moment that when you get thirsty, you walk to the side of your lemonade stand, you look both ways, you cross the street, then to buy a glass of tasty lemonade from your competitor. And you do this three to four times a day. And when your friends show up, you tell them, well, the stuff we got here is a little pricey and it's decent, but the stuff over there is pretty cheap and it's good. And you continue to fund your enemy. Is he going to get worse? Is it going to be easier to establish dominance over him or her? Or is it the absolute antithesis of that? Because you're funding him. You're giving him money to get better. You're giving him money to train his people better. You're giving him money to obtain better products, better resources, better military, better whatever. Just better. Freedom of mind, money, and media. Why money? Because money is freedom and money is success. So when you are feeding your adversary or a foreign entity and pumping them full of money, you're only aiding to their success. That's a fact. So better products, you avoid dependence on foreign entities, you get higher paying jobs, you just get better products overall, okay? And you keep your business stateside, you keep your jobs here. We used to be a domestic production superpower, okay? One last thing I'd like you to consider, because I know it frustrates the hell out of me. When you buy something and it breaks, and you got to pick up your phone and call customer support, and you hear, Hello, thank you for calling Intel Corporation, Domestic Partnership, Customer Service. My name is Steve. How can I help you? And you're like, there's nan motherfucking way this dude's name is Steve. Ain't happening. It's Sanjia or Kumar or Baptista, which is okay. There's only one problem with that. His native language is not your native tongue, okay? Now, our, our uh, triggered friends will say, well, big Luke, that's, that's kind of wrong. That's kind of racist. That's kinda... No, it's not, guys. It's common sense and logic. It's okay to say that it's hard to understand somebody who doesn't speak the language that you speak, okay? doesn't matter if you go to Mother Russia and you talk to Vladi and she tells you that her boots are, you know, <laughs> they're very nice, but when they come up and pass the knees, a little bit tighter than the language touch my underwear. Right. Okay, because you can fucking understand that. No, doesn't make her wrong. Just makes her somebody who speaks a different language, okay? Oh, hello, honey, come here. Yo, take your nail, come here, sit down. Yeah, I sit down here, round the feet. You a good one, $20. Yeah, okay, I think I good cut of you. It's tough to understand that. And when Sandhya said, I'm happy to tell you today, your problem is good one, what does seem to be a problem today? And you go, um... Yeah, my TV, it won't turn on. Oh, yes, Mr. Mister Mike, I'm so sorry to hear about this one. Yes, I understand from what you are telling me that your TV does not start to be working okay today. And I want to, as representative for Intel Corporation, let you know, we will work very hard so much today to solve this problem. Then the report of a shotgun is heard and a body hits the floor. A benefit to doing business, the good old US of A, is you can fucking understand the person on the other end of the phone, okay? Is that wrong to say? 
Is it mean to say? Guys, stop and think about it. Sometimes I just want to grab your cute little ears and shake, even though I love you. And those of you out there know who I'm talking to, okay? To just deduce everything down to how it could possibly be negative or divisive or non-unifying or non-inclusive. This, that. How about we just talk about common sense? It's okay to say that it's difficult to understand somebody who's on the other end of the phone that speaks a different language, that communicates poorly in your native language, and it's okay to say you prefer to talk to somebody who speaks the way you speak. That is okay. Why? Because it does not come from a place of malicious intent. You're not trying to hurt anybody. You're trying to fix your fucking TV as quickly as possible with as minimal frustration as you possibly can. And it's okay that you're frustrated and you don't wanna to talk to somebody who does not speak good English, okay? We're gonna move past this now. And the final piece I'd like to discuss, very simply, is slave labor, okay? As you walk through the mall with your padded Nikes, or you swipe left or right on your iPhone, these items are produced by slave labor. Okay, it may not be touted as that, literally, but do you know what the average working salary of a Chinese factory worker is? 55,000 yuan. Right, sounds not so bad. 55K a year, it's a thousand bucks a week. What are you talking about, man? It's not so bad. Except the only problem is 55,000 yuan, roughly translates to 7,900 US dollars a year. And I promise you, the standard of living in China is not so low that you can get by just fine on 7,900 bucks. I barely have a decent quality used car that I can sell you for 7,900 bucks, let alone expect an entire family to survive on that dollar amount for 365 days. So as you buy these products who have taken over the marketplace, whom are supported by the big ones like Drake and The Rock and every other bit of Hollywood, all the icons, the Kardashians, the Lady Gagas, stop and consider that you are contributing to a working wage of 7,900 bucks a year. You're buying a product from a country where somebody's expected to live off eight grand. Very simple. Now, guys, we're not gonna change the world in a day, okay? I own Nike products because there are products that they make that are superior to others. And the cost benefit analysis at that time told me that was the product to buy. So I don't stand here on a soapbox and preach to you from a place of perfection. But what I can do is I can think and hypothesize and postulate with you in this forum for discussion. One moment, for those of you listening or watching, I'm taking a sip of water. Because it's live. And I'm thirsty. a boy. <laughs> like Pavlov's bell, there he comes. Guys, it's plain and simple. We wanna get better, right? We want freedom of mind, money, and media, okay? We'd like to make more money. We'd like to have better jobs. We would like to run our own business. We would like to succeed in life. We would like to have healthy relationships. We would like to have good, reasonable, and compassionate discourse with our peers. We would like a strong country who is safe and secure, where we have leaders who have our best interests in mind, where we have creators of content like yours truly who are willing to discuss the things that are taboo, who are willing to have a conversation with you and do a little research and bring some things to the forefront that you may not already know, okay? Why am I talking about this today? I said in the beginning that I was gonna wait till a little ways in to discuss why this pertained to me directly. Well, hey, Dale, somebody reached out to me 
and said, hey man, you know, and it was a very humbling moment, put a big smile on my face. This is somebody who's a follower, somebody who's local to my area. And he sent me a message and he said, hey man, I'm at work and I'm listening to Man of the Free and we're all into it and, you know, we're all watching, we're all getting down with it, man, to the point that when the phone rings, they ask me to pause it, right? We like your stuff, man. You're just an average Joe bringing a good message forward and we like to listen to it, man. It kind of inspires us. It gives us some hope. It teaches us a few things and it helps us see that, man, there's people out there that would really like us to do better. And that I don't have to buy into some celebrity bullshit, or I don't have to buy into some celebrity brand, or I don't have to pay a $22.99 membership fee just to get the content. You're just a dude who spent a little bit of money to build a studio, and you're just talking about the shit that's real. So Big Luke, thanks. I like your shit. Thank you, brother. Dale, I told him I'd shot him out. There you go, Dale. Appreciate you, brother. Dale also reached out to me the other day and said, hey... Big Luke, where the fuck is your content? He didn't really say that, but that was the message he was portraying. It had been a couple weeks since he got a video. He was missing Man of the Free, which I appreciate. Hits me, hits me right in the heart, man. I appreciate that. And he asked me when the next video was coming. I told him, I said, hey, man, I'm on vacation. And then Ruben over here, Mr. Uh, Ricola, he got sick on me, okay? And I said, you know, it's been a little bit. But this weekend, I'm going to get you some good content. I'm going to get you a good show. Matter of fact, brother, I'm going to shout you out. He's like, oh, shit, bro. That's great. Thank you. I said, matter of fact, Dale, we're on business. What do you want to hear? And Dale said, well, you know what, Luke? As you know, I'm in manufacturing, okay? Now, his capacity in the company, I don't know if he's vice president or if he's production manager, if he's CEO or whatever. I know he's about first or second in command, Maybe in the top three, I don't know. I know he's up there. And I know that he has scratched and fucking clawed his way to that position. I know a long time ago that he started on the ground floor as a guy who was helping to build and produce and whatever was necessary. And this family owned, there it is, that theme, family owned, you know, those companies, those private companies that spend 20% more on their employees' training and promotion, that spend 20% more on new hardware and products, that spend 20% more on upgrading their machinery and retooling their plants. Those companies, one of which Dale worked for, they decided to invest in him, move him up the ladder because he was producing at such a breakneck pace, he earned it. Now, He's one of the top links in the chain of command. And for that, I commend you, Dale. But Dale's facing a problem right now. And that problem is he's doing something he never thought he would have to do. The fact that he's even considering doing what he's doing right now fucking floors him. And it should. Because Dale works for a company who prides themselves in quality, not quantity, not being the cheapest guy on the shelf. The people that make the best product at a reasonable price, which will beat any day decent product for the best price. I promise you that. And once you get a few nickels to rub together to where you don't have to compare price tags and shelves and scan for coupons and comparison shop and try to get the online price and try to remember to bring the little gift card and the $5 in reward bucks, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, but when you can walk into the store and say, yeah, that one's not ridiculously overpriced and I know it's the best one. I'll take that one. That is a moment of freedom. That's freedom of mind and freedom of money. But Dale can't worry about that right now because Dale's vendors, the people that are coming to him, okay, the people that he produces products for, they're looking to glance past him and go cheaper. They're looking to go overseas. They're looking to go to a place that has no shame, that's only concerned about bringing the almighty dollar to their side of the pond and producing an inferior product that eh, gets the job done, fits the mold, screws into place, meets the measurements and the guidelines, but it's probably not going to last very long. But it's a nickel cheaper per that's what Dale's up against. So Dale asked me if I could do an episode that reminded people about the importance of buying American, that talked to people about the struggle that the business owner 
and the American worker has gone through and goes through. So that's why we're here today, ladies and gentlemen, because as the man of the free, I promised you since day one that I would talk about the topics that you want to hear. And I would only speak on them from a place of personal experience. I'm a business owner. I'm a domestic business owner. I buy parts. I deal with distributors. And I can tell you that I see firsthand the detriment of sending jobs and money overseas. We're not in a good way, ladies and gentlemen. And I don't mean to be Debbie Doomsday, but if we keep heading down the road that we are, there's going to be very few high-paying middle-class jobs left in this country. And unfortunately, when we lose the middle class, we lose the backbone of the United States of America. And there's days that I think that that's the goal. But I don't want to be a doomsday prophet. What I'm here to do is to remind you, my fellow American, that there is merit in buying American goods and services. That we should be compelled to support our fellow countrymen and women. The goal should not be to buy the cheapest product, guys. Okay, now there are times where it's necessary, and I understand that. There are times of financial duress where ramen noodles come in very handy. I've been there. I've walked that walk, okay? There are times where going to Walmart and getting the cheapest thread count sheets that they have because that's all you can afford right now as a college sophomore or as somebody who's newly entered the working class and you're splitting the rent of your first townhouse with somebody that you work with and you just don't got it, I understand. And to you, sir or ma'am, I don't hold you accountable, okay? You're a child. Or if you've just come off some recent tragedy in your life and you're in financial duress and you gotta go the dollar store route, more power to you, that's what it's there for. But that's where it should stay. And there should be no shame in your game if you've come upon hard times or if you're young because that market is there for you. But that's what that market was created for and that's where it should stay. The overarching theme here is that I'm speaking to my fellow Americans who got a few nickels to rub together. If you are capable, and I don't mean capable like you think you have to be a multimillionaire and have hundreds of thousands of disposable income, and then you can frivolously buy what you want to buy. No. What I mean is, when that moral bell dings, and you're standing in the aisle of the shop, and you see the American-made product there for $3.89, and right next to it, is the overseas produced equivalent for $1.99. For those $2, that buck 89, that you know you'll waste on a cup of coffee that never gets drank, that you know you will buy some ridiculous trinket at the dollar store for your kid and they'll never touch it again, that you know could very easily go to waste. Invest that money in the future of the country in which you live. Invest that money and your buddy three houses down who works at Anheuser-Busch. Invest that money to ensure that your children have a job tomorrow and that they're not gonna live on Zoom calls for the rest of their career. Keep that money right here at home, America. Support your local businesses, support your American companies, spend a little bit more, that's all I'm asking for. I look you in your eyes and I compel you, please, to spend just a touch more to ensure the safety, the security, and the future of the country in which we live. Be American and buy American with pride. But most importantly, create something. For those of you who've listened to this episode and you're compelled you feel a sense of pride. You think back to the forefathers who fought and died before us for the land we walk upon and the freedoms that we appreciate and share every day. If you're the kind of person that watches old glory fly in the sky and understands it's not to be knelt for, 
It's not some banner of racial prejudice and vitriol. It's not even political. It's not even a talking point. It's a piece of artwork. The stars and the stripes, the colors of that flag, represent a great country. A country that was fought and died for. A country where good people stood up to bad people and fought and died so they could be represented fairly, they could pursue life, liberty, and happiness. And they made sure by death and by sacrifice that you and I are able to share those same liberties today. Furthermore, create something. Guys, if you're sitting back compelled by this episode, if you appreciate that flag, start doing something. Create a business. Create a product. Create an idea. Next week, on Friday, I'm flying to Manhattan because I'm working with a team of digital content creators, people who make digital products, I'm working with them because I'm working on a technology and I'm not going to get into it. I'll save that for another episode and it'll be closer to when I have the final product that I can show you, but it has nothing to do with selling cars. It has nothing to do with mind, money, and media other than I've used my freedom of mind and I've spent some of my money to have some influence on media and I can't wait to produce it, but I'm creating I'm trying to make the world a better place. I'm trying to create a product that will help get people out of a bad environment. I'm trying to create a product that will entertain. And I can't wait to bring it to you and talk to you about it more. But I'm doing it because it keeps money here. It keeps money in my pocket. It keeps my brain thinking and it will ultimately benefit people. So if you have aspirations of opening a business, you want to wash windows, you want to pressure wash houses, paint decks. You want to sell baseball cards. You want to film card breaks online. You want to be a gamer. You want to be a builder. You want to be a real estate broker. You want to be something. You want to be somebody. Do it. I compel you. Because this country and this economy is the only place in the world that at any given time, on any given day, any given American can do whatever they want to do whenever they choose to do it. Stay hungry. Stay proud. Stay focused. Stay American. But most importantly, stay free. <laughs>